fills their soul with joy. When his holy lips receive us, and his songs are done to glory, precious King, oh how sweet, oh the birth and joy of heaven, precious King, oh how sweet.
page 397. 397 is where we are last from the way to move. 397. Trust in Jesus. 
to be quite frank with you, I didn't get very far last week, and I suspect we shall not get far today because there is so much good stuff here for us to look at. I am so happy to be here today. I really am. And uh, I expressed that in the Sunday school lesson, and I'm expressing it now um, because I, I really enjoy the opportunities to preach and to teach the Word of God. I get excited about it, and I hope that, that you are also uh, blessed by it. Romans chapter 8, and we're going to read the first 11 verses. And uh, last week we got, boy, I'm way off of my pages here. We only got through the first two verses. I'll be lucky if I get through three and four uh, today, but we'll see. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you, now, are, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that, uh, that dwelleth in you." All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we start. Father, I want to thank you for thy precious word. I want to thank you for this wonderful book that we've been studying out of and for the deep truths that are found therein, how we are greatly encouraged and strengthened, and yet we, our frailties are, are clearly marked out in our scriptures and uh, or by the scriptures. And Father, we... We know that we are not what we should be, but there's no condemnation. Father, what a glorious, glorious thought to us. Now, Father, I ask that you would teach us. You'd move amongst us, that you would stir us, that we should be holy and righteous, just, equitable in all of our dealings, that we would be and manifest ourselves to be the children of God, those who walk in the Spirit of Christ. In, our sins, in the Son's name, amen. Now, last week, I barely got through the introduction, but we looked at a declaration of righteousness means no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Why are we not condemned? Because of the work and act of justification. That's why I've dealt with this as a declaration of justification. You guys say, well, I don't see justification there. No, it's there because there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation because we have been justified in Christ Jesus. And then we saw that a man cannot be condemned for which he has been justified. So if you have been justified from your sin, then you are, cannot be condemned by your sin. It's really that simple. Now, some people take license with that and say, so if I can't be condemned my, by my sin, then I'll just go sin. I'll just enjoy the pleasures of this life. Well, I'm going to tell you then, then you do not walk in the spirit of Christ, but you walk in the spirit of the flesh, or, or in, in your flesh. Therefore, you are not a child of God, and you have not been justified, and you are under just condemnation. So those who have this idea that you can just go live how you want to live in your flesh and fulfill the lust of your flesh because you're not under condemnation, do not understand 
the concepts here that Paul is teaching. And that ye must be born from above in order to have the Spirit of Christ in you, in order to, be, to, to experience justification, you must be born from above. And so that's something that, that uh, you know, sometimes people take issue with that because they're ignorant, foolish, or at enmity with God. So we'll, we'll, that's true. And so then we looked at last week is when did God judicially declare us justified? And we saw how he had done that in eternity. So the vicious decree of God came down in eternity and declared us justified. And he justified us in our election. And we saw that uh, in, uh, let's see, chapter, I think it's chapter 8 here. Um, I'm pausing because I didn't refresh myself on this. But so, oh, who, who is he that condemneth? Yeah, there, verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? I'm sorry, verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God select? It is God that justified us. And therefore we are justified in our election. So we saw that when did he elect us? We went back and showed where he elected us from eternity. Therefore that justification, that decree of righteousness came down from eternity. And then we saw that this judicious declaration was based upon the work of Christ. In other words, it was based upon what Christ would do for us in time. That is, that He went to the cross and He died and He rose again for our justification. Romans chapter 4, verse 28 and 29. And so we saw that in time, Christ died for our sin. That forgiveness of sins is preached through Christ because that's where forgiveness was. Forgiveness is justification. Someone says, well, where's justification and the forgiveness? The fact that you're forgiven is the act of justification. Declared righteous. Um, then in 5.9 it says, much more being now just, now justified by the blood, by his blood, we shall be saved. Now we're justified, we shall be saved from, uh, through, from wrath through him. So we saw that in time, Jesus died and, and paid the penalty for our justification that was decreed by God from eternity. And that's about where we left off, I think. The eternal justification that was declared by the Father, purchased by the Son, is now experienced by the believer in our conversion. That's when we experience justification. No, we got past this part last week, if I remember. So we see that, that here's all three, three aspects of justification. Declared by God in eternity and declared righteous, paid for in time by the Lord Jesus Christ and experienced by us through faith in our conversion. That's how it happened. When people read about justification, they have a problem because a lot of times they don't put it in its proper place. Was it talking about a judicial act of God? Was it talking about what Christ did in time by the shedding of his blood? Or is it by what we experienced, which was our justification? And so there's, uh, sometimes there's confusion on this issue. I don't want to be confusing to you. I want you to know. So when you read the Bible and you read about the forgiveness of sin and you read about justification, then you can look and see, was he talking about that which I experienced or that which he decreed from the beginning? You know, all of these things. So uh, that, that'll help you in your study. Now, there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what it says? Which are in Christ Jesus. Now, I can't express to you how relieved I am. And my soul sings out with joy because I'm in Christ. Therefore, there is no condemnation. It is to them that are in Christ. Well, how did you get there? Through election, the death of Christ, and the experience of conversion. You, you were in Christ from the beginning. From the very, before the beginning, before time was ever created, you were in Christ. That's what we call our union with Christ. Now, I know that there are many condemnable things that I do. I do many condemnable things. In fact, I've probably done a few of them this morning. Some evil thought, some manner of speech, some action. Because we, do you know that you do condemnable, condemnable things all day? Why? Because we're still in this flesh and bone. 
We still have the spirit of the old man. So we do that. But, but I can't express how relief I am that there is no condemnation, even though I do condemnable things. Or I have a thought, or something I said or done. Paul did not say that there was nothing condemnable in us. He didn't say that. But rather, there is not one sentence of condemnation against us. We have condemnable things in us, but there's no sentence of condemnation against us. We're not condemned because we're in Christ Jesus. Now, we ourselves know that we are condemnable. We know that. And we ought to, as the children of God, have great sorrow in our heart because of our sin. We ought to be sorry for our sin. It ought to cause us to weep. It ought to cause us to, to be angry with ourselves about the sin we do. Do you ever find yourself angry about what you've done? Some sin that you've committed? Some aspect of your life that's not conformed to, the, to Christ and become angry with it? You ought to be. You ought to be very angry with you. You know, that's, that's the spirit. That's the spirit of Christ. When we become angry with that old man that does such wicked things and we repent and we confess our sin and he's faithful and forgive. Faith. What's that? Faithful and just. I don't know why I couldn't get to that just part. Faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see... That's what God does. We do condemnable things. We ought to be angry with ourselves because of it. We ought to hate it. But we love the things of God. But you know, hating those things that are in us that we know are not pleasing to the Lord shows us that the Spirit of God is in us. Because otherwise we'd just love those things. They wouldn't bother us. They wouldn't bother our conscience at all. We have great sorrow. But you know, 1 John 3.20, he says this, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. You know what? My heart condemns me. It does. For the things that I do, the actions I take, things I say, my heart condemns me. But God is greater than my heart. And there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You see, the very Word of God is quite able to condemn us. All you have to do is read the Scriptures, and it condemns us. It shows us our shortcomings and our failures with, without any problem. And, and there's uh, most certainly the great accuser of the brethren, Satan, who stands constantly before God and brings accusations of condemnation against us. But we being justified of the Father and of the blood of the Lord Jesus, have no condemnation. Not from the Father, because He justifies us. Not of the Son, for by His righteousness we are justified. And nor of the Holy Spirit, because He bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God and in a state of justification. See, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work to show us that we are not under a just condemnation. I don't know about you, but that thrills my soul. That gets me excited to know these things are true. Now, lest some err, err in their understanding, we certainly are under just condemnation as considered in Adam. I read in a debate where we were, we were, you know, people who hold our, doc, our doctrinal positions say, well, you, you believe you're never under condemnation, that there's no condemnation because you've been in Christ forever. Listen, folk, don't make a mistake. We are under just condemnation in our flesh while we were in Adam. We, or if we're in Adam, or we are in Adam, aren't we? We all have flesh and bone. We've all been born a man. So, and we all have the, the sin of, of Adam in us. So in, in Adam, we stand fully convicted and condemned and justly so. However, in the narrative here, Paul is showing the difference between being in Christ and our being in Adam. Our being in Adam is in the flesh. When we were, when we were first saved, we felt the real 
the real weight of condemnation. Didn't you not feel condemned of your sin? Did you not feel the burden of guilt, extreme guilt, and the, the worthiness of being condemned to hell when you believed? I don't know about I did. I did. I knew I was a sinner and justly condemned. And we were when we were in Adam. And, and, and I'm to preach one's condemnation and guilt to all the unbelieving because all the, underbelie all the unbelieving are under just condemnation. But when we're saved and you experience that great gospel blessing of justification and the great, and the great weight of condemnation and guilt, what does it do? It falls away. Because you've been cleansed. You've been washed by the blood. And all of it goes away. You no longer feel the weight of such condemnation. And guilt. And it gives way to mercy and grace. That's in Christ Jesus. You know, now know and experience the love of Christ. For the love of God is shed abroad in our whole heart by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So we, we understand and experience the love of God. We experience justification. We experience mercy. We experience faith. All these things we get and experience in the new birth. And in our conversion. You see... The law is what brings condemnation. Because we're guilty of the law, it condemns us. But the gospel is free, is to free men from their condemnation. That's what the gospel does. Let's see if I can remember that old poem again. I always keep forgetting how it goes. I'll try it. Let's see. Um, no, never mind. I'm just, I can sit down. Uh, any other day, I'll, I'll remember it. But when I stand up here and I get to preach, if I don't put it in my notes, I'm, it's a, I'm a goner. So we'll just keep right on going. Second of all we see is a declaration of justification is marked out by walking in the Spirit of Christ. Verse 2. I, uh, I didn't get as far as I thought I did. Verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So the declaration of justification, which releases us from condemnation, is marked out by walking in the spirit of Christ. So when we are believers, we're going to walk in the spirit of Christ. Not in our flesh, but in the spirit of Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, justification through eternal decree, propitiated at Calvary, experienced by faith, is evidenced in a sanctified walk. So while all these things are true, it is evidenced, proved by a sanctified walk. We walk in the Spirit of Christ. The title of this message, as long as it's going to be three or four Sundays, is Walking in Christ. Now, aren't you glad I'm not preaching this in a single message? We'll be here for, oh, till sometime tonight, no doubt. <laughs> we'll have to take a break for lunch, though, won't we? All right. This is walking after the Spirit. Walking after the Spirit. Who walketh not after the flesh but after the Spirit. That's how we walk, as we walk after the Spirit. In other words, in the way of the Spirit of Christ. That's how we walk. We know that until one is, one is born from above, there's no visible distinction between the elect of God and others. The children of the devil and the elect of God all look the same before we are saved. There's no distinction between them, for we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of her flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. That's how we were by our nature. That's how we were before we were saved. We, there was no difference between the elect of God and those that are not. We all look the same because we all had the same nature. But God changed our nature, gave us a different nature, and therefore we are marked out from them who are the children of the devil. Now, we're marked out by the spirit of life. 
Well, the law is life. Chapter 7, verse 10, in fact, it says, And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. It says, well, we are marked up by the Spirit of life, but while the law is life, we are dead. And the law has only one work. Condemnation. It is that of condemnation because he said, I found, my, I found to be unto death. And sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. So the, the commandment of God was death to us. We were slain by it. It was not life. It was ordained to life, but not for us. We couldn't do that which the law demanded. It is not a spirit of life, it's not a spirit of life, but rather of death. But now we have the spirit of life. We now have the spirit of life, and that life also has a law. Did you? It's the law of Christ. And we're obedient to the law of Christ. We believe the law of Christ. It is the law and life of Christ free from condemnation. Aren't you glad that Christ kept the law for you? And then imparted to us His righteousness and, and put in our account His righteousness so that we're no longer under that just condemnation? What a wonderful thing. And now He's given us life. And you know the law is the law of Christ, which is not a different law than Moses in reality. It's just that we are not under condemnation. We are free to obey the law of Christ. And then when we fail, we can seek forgiveness. But the law still does not condemn. Because Christ... We sing that song, I, lo I love that song, Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. You know, there's nothing, nothing that isn't paid for by the blood of Christ. Now, there's a change in those who are the children of God by faith. There's a change. You have moved from darkness into light, from death unto life. That's a change, wouldn't you say? And I would call that a pretty drastic change, wouldn't you? They are born again. They have received new life, the new man, and have received the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They are manifested to be children of God because that's what the Scripture said, that we are manifested to be the children of God. Because, and how do we know? Because we cry out, Abba, Father, we cry out, Daddy, Daddy, a very, a term of endearment because we love God. For the first time, we actually love God. And we see Him as a loving, tender, heavenly Father who redeemed us and saved us from our sin and that the condemnation has been lifted and life and light has been given unto us. There's a change. The children of God are different than the children of this world. One great distinction that they have is faith. The faith of God. You believe the Word of God. That is a distinctive change from where you were before because at one point you hated the Word of God. You didn't believe the Word of God. But when faith, but when Christ came in you and you, you were regenerated and born from above and received the Spirit of God, you had faith to believe. That's exciting. I believe this book. I believe this book and I am under obligation to teach it and preach it as it is revealed in the Word. Now, I'm going to tell you that gets difficult sometimes. It is. It's difficult. Because you know what? Because you're, go, you're going to go upstream and you're going to go against the, the trends and the opinions and you're going to go against the, the traditions of men as far as religion is concerned. And we'll be despised. I'll be despised because of it. I might even be considered no preacher of righteousness because I won't go the way everyone else is going. And you know, sometimes I feel a little lonely. I, I, I love to have sweet fellowship of brethren. But it doesn't always happen that way. 
We have faith. Ephesians 4.22, that ye put off concerning the former, well not, only, well, not just faith, but we repent of sin and we do battle against the deeds of the flesh. That's something that we do because that is what is required of us and because we want to. The Spirit of Christ wants to do battle with the deeds of the flesh. You want to put off the evil, wicked things of this flesh. You want to do it. You know, there's a lot of things that I have to do that I don't like to do, but I have to do it. But this is something I want to do. It's hard. It's difficult. But in Ephesians 4.22 it says, That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. That's exactly what the old man is. Paul said that in this flesh, that is in me, in this flesh dwelt not one good thing, not a single thing is worthy of, a thi of any kind of commendation it's all condemnation I, i'm corrupt according to the deceitful flesh then he goes on and says let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking but he put away with you be put away from you with all malice now i don't mean i don't know i have to go check the english i don't know whether it's supposed to be malice that we're putting away or we're supposed to put away these things with malice so either way it works So what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? What does it mean? This is the distinction that Paul made in chapter 7 and verse 25 when he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So Paul makes that distinction. And then in chapter 6 it says, Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, to walk in the Spirit is not what is often done in the flesh and attributed to walking in the Spirit. How many times do we see that? We do things that we do in our flesh but we say we're walking in the Spirit. That happens all the time. You know, us holy, pious preachers, we're always walking in the Spirit. We never fall down. Our preaching is always in the Spirit of Christ, isn't it? No, sometimes that preaching's in the strength of the flesh. But we say it's in the Spirit. We can do things that we think that we're, that we're following the Spirit of God and walking in the Spirit. All of us do this sometimes. And really, it's a work of our flesh. We spiritualize the work of our flesh is what we've done. Men attributing the work of God to a work that they do in their flesh. Men do it all the time. It's, it's done all the time. And shame for shame for shame. I think about those preachers, those evangelists and missionaries who go from church to church to church. You know, they only have like three or four sermons in their whole repertoire. They just they go to a different church, so they preach the same sermon at a different church. How many times do you preach that same sermon before you're preaching it in the flesh and not in the spirit? Why don't you dig in the Word of God and come up with something fresh and new that the Lord has blessed you with so you can get excited about it and preach in the Spirit of Christ? Yeah, some preachers are so polished on their sermons. You know it's in the flesh. They're not being led by the Spirit. We can do many things while walking in the flesh. And it is not the putting off of bad habits and getting better habits. That's not walking in the Spirit. It is not being more disciplined in life. That is, uh, you know, to be a good soldier. They teach you in basic training. What they teach you in basic training is discipline. They discipline you. They get you so that you get up at a certain time, you go to bed at a certain time, you got to make your bed a certain way, you got to march, you got to do, you got to do all these things. The idea is to break you down and then build you back up to be the man that they want you to be, to be a good soldier. 
It involves discipline. So it's not being more disciplined. That's not walking in the Spirit. It's not keeping a set of Christian rules of conduct. We, I don't know how many churches and how many people, Christians, have the idea and have in their mind a rule of Christian conduct. Now, is there conduct that is becoming a Christian? Yes. Is there conduct of, that the, as becoming of the gospel of Christ? Yes, there is. But it's not a set of rules that you and I make up. It's not church tradition. There are churches who say, well, you can't be a member here if you do this or if you do that. I know of a church that says if you're a smoker, you can't be a member of our church. And that's all right if they want to make that rule. If you're a smoker and you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you want to be a member of this church, you can come right up here and be a member of this church. I'm not going to make that rule. Now, do I think that you ought to stop having that habit of that habitual habit of smoking? Yes. But I don't see that in the scriptures as being a disqualifying event in your life that ought to keep you from being a member of a church of the Lord Jesus. Now that, that might be my opinion. But you know what? Every church is independent of the other and can do whatever they feel that is right in the Lord. Even if you want to violate Scripture, that's alright. Being an independent church, I just won't agree with you on it. That's for sure. So it's not a Christian rules of conduct. It isn't, it isn't tradition. Walking in the Spirit is not defined by your character. It's not defined by your character. That's not how you walk in the Spirit. Uh, a, a good reformation can accomplish all these things. You can be reformed and accomplish all these things, but that does not change who you are. A drug addict can reform and not be a drug addict. An alcoholic can reform and not be an alcoholic. A bad person can reform and become a good person. But that doesn't change who you are on the inside. That doesn't make you born from above. That doesn't make you walk in the Spirit of Christ. It just makes you reformed. See, the problem with most people's concepts of the life of a Christian is that it is defined by the laws of good Christian conduct. He's a good Christian because he does this and that. And the other thing, look at his conduct. He must be a good Christian. Listen to the way he speaks. He's got to be a good Christian. And I agree with you, a good Christian will speak right and walk right and act right. But it's not reform. It's not what happens on the outside, not what you disciplined yourself to do. It's a work on the inside. It's a change of the person. Living as a good religious person will earn you living as a good religious person will not earn you a place in heaven. You can be as religious as religious can be, but it will not get you into heaven. Just ask all those monks and and, and papists and all those that are just and, and Mohammedists and others are just absolutely fanatic on their religion and doing all the right things that their religion teaches them. That doesn't get you into heaven. It is this mentality of Pharisaism. If I do all the right works, I will go to heaven. That's what the Pharisee thought. That's why he was so diligent in trying to keep the law and yet on the very backside violating the law of God blatantly, but at least in his appearance he appeared to be a keeper of the law. See, they would judge a person as truly spiritual by their conformity to the law. Oh, you're a spiritual person because you're conformed to the law. Oh, you're a spiritual person because you've got a good Christian conduct. There are a lot of good men in a lot of churches that are unbelievers. And they're serving in positions as pastors and deacons and elders in churches. Because they're good men, but have not had a heart changed by the by the working of the holy spirit there's nothing wrong with conduct becoming a truly born again one the problem arises with whether that conduct comes from having a renewed spirit and thus the renewing of the mind or that or that of a reformed life without christ is it because you you have been renewed in your mind or by christ 
or is it because you've been reformed by your religion? You can be religious. You can be reformed. But have you been changed? Are you changed? Are you different on the inside? And because you're different on the inside, it comes out to the outside. And you manifest yourself as being a child of God. The basis for our not being under condemnation is that we are free from the law of or principle of sin and death. We're free from that law, that principle of sin and death. How? By virtue of our union with Christ. Because we are in union with Christ, we are free from that sin principle. There's no other reason by which we could possibly be free from the law of sin and death except a way be made for us. Unless God had made a way for us, we could not be free. Just as God made a way for Israel to escape the Egyptians through the Red Sea, so He must make a way for, for uh, a way to cancel the sin principle that is in us. That law of sin and death needs to be canceled. The only way to have done it was to put us in Christ because Christ died. And when He died, we died with Him. And the old flesh was crucified with Him. And then we arose, we arose with Him, a new man. Because we were united with with Christ. That's how it is possible that sin and death could be canceled in us. Jesus paid it all. Now, I'm going to stop here before we get to verse 3 because I, I'm, I've, I've used up a lot of my time already. I, I don't want to rush through this. I want you to get all the juicy details. I want the juices just to be running down corners of your mouth just like you're biting in a nice sweet plum or something because this is rich this is rich it's powerful it's a blessing it's an encouragement to know what Christ has done for us therefore we are under no condemnation we're going to look next week at the declaration of justification is manifested in our sanctification. Uh, this, I think we've already started on that, but we're going to get more into it when we get into verse 3. I hope you've been blessed this morning and encouraged. I mean, I could keep on preaching for a while, but, but this looks like a good place to stop in my notes. I don't want to leave anything out, all right? Father, thank you for being kind to us, gracious and loving. Thank you for your blessed word the strength that we find in it, the goodness, the, the blessings, the encouragement. Father, that, that there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, for putting us in the Son by your gracious decrees. Glorify the Son in us, manifest that we might manifest ourselves to the world this week. In Jesus' name, amen.